Hello, this is Dr. Donald Pelto, and now I'm going to be showing you how to do a comprehensive diabetic foot exam. This is an exam that uh, you can see on the sheet that you can all download on the website. It's a comprehensive diabetic foot exam. The first portion of the exam is where I discuss with the patient when they had their last foot care appointment, when their last comprehensive diabetic foot exam, when their last medical history was, and any medications they may have and then if they have any new foot problems at this point. And next I also ask who is their doctor that they're seeing for their diabetes, when their last fasting blood sugar is, their last hemoglobin A1C, just as a reminder, it should be around seven, and then how many years that they've had diabetes. The more years that someone has diabetes, the more risks of neuropathy, which is nerve problems, or nephropathy, which can be kidney problems, or any other type of diabetes problems in the feet or elsewhere. Any allergies and then what type of diabetes they have. We also go over a review of systems if they have any joint aches or pains, any skin problems, any numbness or tingling in their feet, any cramping when they walk such as claudication, any types of problems like they, they urinate a lot, they're thirsty a lot or they eat a lot and then also any other types of problems. Usually when someone develops something like nephropathy, which is kidney problems or eye problems called retinopathy, their diabetes is more in an advanced state. Next I want to go over what you'll need for your diabetic foot exam. You're going to need a few instruments. You're going to need uh, something to check the reflexes of the patient. You're going to need a vibratory tuning fork. This is to check for neuropathy. And you're also going to need a Sims Weinstein monofilament where you push down to the tip and you need to learn how to put the, the proper pressure. What you do is you actually push to the tip, bend it a little bit, and if they can't feel that, that would be a sign of neuropathy. And as well, something to tell if it's sharp or if it's dull when they're feeling. So we'll begin our exam and you can follow along on the sheet of paper, but the first portion I look at is the foot itself. So when you look at the foot, you look for first of all any, what we call them, digital deformities. Okay, what deformities would be are any hammer toes or bunions or areas that are very, very prominent that could rub in the shoes. So looking at this patient's feet, there really isn't any anything. I do notice this little toe on the side curves down. That would be a little bit of a hammer toe, but it's not something that's rubbing on the toes or on the shoes. If it was rubbing, it would tend to have a callus on the top of it. If someone has a curved toe, it can be a problem because it could rub on the tip and cause a, uh, a callus or even an ulcer. So in terms of digital deformities, there is none. Next I'm going to look at equinus. Equinus is, comes from a horse being equine and having a tight heel cord. So if the heel cord in the back of the leg is very tight, what happens is I can't get it past 90 degrees. But this patient definitely can get it much past 90 degrees. A lot of my patients, if they have a tight heel cord, I try to push up and they can't push up past 90 degrees right here at the ankle joint. And what, what happens is they tend to put more pressure to the front of the foot. So if you can imagine if you had a foot wound on the bottom and you had a very tight heel cord, every time you're walking, you're putting a lot of pressure to the front of the foot and it would make it hard for that ulcer to heal. So the next step we look at is equinus. The next one after that is something called a plantar flexed metatarsal. If you look from the side, we wanna see if any of these, these are all the metatarsals, and if one of them is more prominent, meaning let's say one is a lot further down than the other ones, that it would be plantar flexed. Now it's normal. Now it's plantar flexed. And this can happen to any of these metatarsal heads. And if you look at this model here, you can actually see that these are the, the metatarsal heads on the top of the foot. And if these are pushed down, it's going to be more prominent. And as you can imagine, there could be an ulcer formed on the bottom of the foot because of that. So that's what a plantar flexed metatarsal is. The next deformity I want to talk to you about is a Charcot deformity. Uh, what Charcot is, is actually a collapsing of the foot. Do you see how this foot normally has a nice arch to it? If someone develops Charcot, what, what happens is the foot collapses down. So instead of having a nice arch, it has kind of a rocker bottom, like a rocking chair, and the foot actually collapses and breaks. The big problem with Charcot foot is it doesn't normally hurt. It's not painful because the individual has neuropathy. It sometimes can be confused because you may have a big wound on the bottom 
and someone may think, well, that's a, that's a foot infection. But normally, infections are misdiagnosed with someone that has charcot. So you have to really determine, do you have a foot infection or do you just have a collapsing or a charcot deformity? Uh, the next aspect, we also look and see if there's any amputations. As you can imagine, if someone, for example, is missing one of the toes and has it amputated, or a portion of the toe, the pressure needs to redistribute about the foot. So there may be more pressure to the bones next door or adjacent to that area that's been amputated, and it can make you have a greater risk. By far, the greatest risk of an ulcer or an amputation is having a previous one. If you've had a previous ulcer, it's always more important to avoid getting another one. That's the biggest risk factor, is having an ulcer or a previous amputation. So that's basically the orthopedic exam. We also look at a pressure stat, and I'll show you a picture of the pressure stat later, but it looks at high pressures on the bottom of the foot, very similar to uh, a checkbook, where you have the, uh, the carbon copy. You can do the carbon copy on the bottom of the foot to see if there's any high pressure areas, and I'll show you a picture that I'll include for you to see the high pressure areas as well. The next portion of the exam I want to look at is the skin exam. Uh, the, the skin exam, there are a few risk factors that we look at in the skin. First of all, does the patient have tinea pedis or athlete's foot? That would mean kind of dry, scrapey skin that's itchy. It can either have on the top, but usually see it on the bottom of the foot, or more importantly, between the toes. If there's dampness or maceration between the toes, that could be tinea pedis. The way we treat that was with some topical antifungals. And it can become a big problem because if there's dampness between the toes, it can very easily get an infection that can spread to the top of the foot, and that can become problematic. We also look at something called cirrhosis or dry skin. If you look at, there's no real dry skin on this patient's feet, but it can a lot of times happen on the bottom of the foot or even get cracking. There can be calluses or cracking on the bottom of the foot that be, can become problematic. You always have to be aware of if there's any cracking or any calluses, calluses always happen first before an ulcer. So if you have calluses anywhere on your foot, mm -hmm. be aware that there's increased pressure and that can greatly lead to an ulceration because that callus can increase the pressure, get a little blister underneath it, and that blister can pop off and, and show a wound underneath. Next thing that we'll look at now is if there's any ulcer, if there's any gangrene, or if there's any been any previous ulcers. Because like I said before, if you've had an ulcer somewhere, you're probably going to get an ulcer in the same place again. I also look at the nails. Are there any ingrown toenails or any thickened toenails? If there's thickened toenails, it would be a fungal infection. I don't see any fungal infection. But I do see, if you look at the edge of this nail, there's some callus around the edge. And that's the beginnings of an ingrown toenail to that area and as well to this area. And you can see there's a little bit of redness on the side and a little bit of an ingrown toenail that can become problematic. Once again, we talked about looking between the toes. And also, lastly, you want to feel the, the, the temperature on the bottom of the feet. And you want to make sure that the temperature on the tops and in the bottoms of your feet is the same. Because if one foot is a lot warmer than the other one, it can indicate an infection. And that's where it's very important for you to not only look at the bottom of your feet, but also look to, and feel the temperature as well. So that completes the first side of this form. Let's go on to the back side. The next aspect we're going to look at, we're going to go out of order. We're going to look at first the circulation. These are the two pulses on your foot, the dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial, and then looking at the neurological aspect as well. So let's start with the pulses. On your foot, you have two pulses. You have one that runs pretty much right down the front of your foot called the dorsalis pedis pulse. And if you put your fingers on the top of the foot, you should be able to feel the pulse with your two fingers. Very similar if you look at the pulse that's on your arm. You can feel the pulse there, and you should be able to feel the pulse if it's a very good pulse on the top of the foot. The other pulse is actually located in the back of the ankle. If you go right behind the ankle and you put your fingers underneath it, you can feel a pulsating pulse right back there. It runs right along this area here. So the, this patient's circulation is excellent. As well, I don't see any swelling. You want to look for swelling around the ankle joint. There's no swelling and there's no varicose veins. Varicose veins typically happen on the inside of the leg. So the circulation exam is very good. A very simple exam that you can do at home is something called the capillary fill time. If you look at the toe, you see it's nice and red. I push down let go, and the redness comes back. 
you count that number of seconds it takes. So one, two, three. If it takes about three seconds to get back for the color, that's normal circulation. If a patient doesn't have good circulation or has different types of cramping or pain in the foot, then we would order different types of circulation studies, maybe an ankle brachial index or something we do in the office called a pad net. They're very, very effective to evaluate the uh, amount of uh, circulatory problems someone may have. And the last aspect I want to look at is going to be the feeling on the, on the bottom of the foot. Really the gold standard for determining how well someone feels is this. This is called a Sims Weinstein. So I, I typically have the patients close their eyes and I push on different areas in the bottom of the foot. So maybe you can do it from the, the side here and I can show you. You want to push and then push and they can feel that. And that's, that's, if they can feel that, that's normal. So you push there, 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 there. You can do the heel, and then you can do the top of the foot. However you do it, you want to be consistent. So every time you check, you're going to evaluate the same spaces and spa same areas. If anyone can't feel one or two of those spots, that means that they're at greater risk of developing a foot wound because this is the amount of pressure you need to be able to feel if you step on something that you're going to know it. It's called protective sensation. So for example, if you step on a rock or if you have something in your shoe, you're you need to do this so you can you be able to at least feel this. This is the most sensitive. The next aspect I like to look at is going to be the vibratory sensation. Let's say someone can feel that in all the spots. Then I actually put this little tuning fork on the tips of the toes. And I tell them, well, tell me when you can't feel it. And if they can feel the same amount as my hand, the vibratory sensation is normal. But for example, if the, if the vibratory sensation, if they can't feel it anymore, and I can still feel it in my hand, it means that some of the neuropathy is beginning in their foot. They're starting to have some neuropathy. So if you look at a feeling scale, um, having no feeling at all and very, very good feeling, what happens is it's a progression. It doesn't all happen at once. You start to lose the vibration sensation, and then you start to lose the sensation to that light touch that we just did with that little piece of plastic. Two other areas that are very important are looking at the, being able to distinguish between something that's a light and something that's very sharp. See that sharp tip? So when I rub the bottom of the foot, someone should be able to tell if that's sharp, that one's sharp, or if that one is dull. And the last aspect, we want to look at the, the reflexes, because what can happen over time is that you can have difficulty with your reflexes, and the reflexes both on the back of the ankle, see how they push, they push down very well, or on the knee can be diminished as well. So that's looking at the neurological aspect of this examination. So we've looked at the vibratory, the loss of protective sensation, the reflexes sharp and dull, the next aspect I like to look at is someone's shoes. Do they have good shoes? Are they too loose? Are they too tight? Too narrow? Too wide? And then if there's anything inside of them, you always want to have a patient put their hand in their shoe before they put it on to make sure that there's nothing inside. And lastly, we look at a wrist stratification. If they have no neuropathy and a normal foot like this patient, just a once a year exam if you have diabetes. If you have neuropathy every six months, if you have neuropathy with poor blood flow or some type of a foot deformity every quarter, and then if you've had a previous ulcer before, it can be actually up to every two months. And you'll probably be seeing your podiatrist or your, your foot specialist uh, frequently for that uh, anyway. And the last aspect, we like to always talk about the risks of diabetes and the importance of glucose control, the blood sugar control, the dangers of the neuropathy, and also the risk stratification. And if there's any high pressure areas, I would show that and the importance of different types of foot instructions. So all this is very, very important, and then we schedule the next exam. And this is basically how you do a comprehensive diabetic foot exam. And every person that has diabetes should be having this exam at least once a year. And even though your doctor looks at your feet, they also look in your eyes. And that's what I, I say to my patients. Your primary care doctor may look in your eyes, but they still want you to see an eye specialist because they can look at some things that are different. And the same thing with seeing a foot specialist. It's very important because they can look at your feet in a different way to see if there's any risk factors for developing calluses or ulcers or eventually amputations. And that's the whole purpose of this is to prevent amputations with this comprehensive diabetic foot exam.